The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. The House of Mystery, and uh, I'm Al Warren, of course. If you don't know, you just haven't listened to anything good. And uh, sitting in today is Brian. <laughs> Brian the Brian Turnoff. That that is me, BJ Turnoff, at your service, sir. Oh, not that boy. type of service, but the other type of service. This type of service. <laughs> well, lip service. <laughs> and uh, wow, what an interesting show already. Um, now uh, joining us today, we have an author, and uh, we call her CS Poet. <laughs> <laughs> We call her C.S. Poe. She said to say anything, but anyway, Carol, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Oh, so this is really interesting. So you've been writing for uh, for a little while, but uh, you wrote with um, Gregory Ash. And, I did. Uh, we, we just had him on, oh, I don't know, a week or two ago, and... Uh, he was he was just saying some awful things about you. So. Oh, I know, I know. I read him the riot act after. <laughs> so how does that work? My God, no. So I, you know, I find that really interesting. We we're talking about writing with another author, and mm-hmm. and and the process. And you guys did it from a distance, right? Right. Like you didn't sit in the same room and and and. No, write. no. He's so, in St. Louis. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the arch. How do, so? How do how do you how do I say this? How do you get into that? Like, how do you how do you do this um, over Zoom or whatever you're doing it over phone or internet? Um, well, we did it through Google Docs, so you can both be in the same document. Um, I don't know. Like at, at first, I it started off having to you know phone conversations talking about kind of the major beats of the story, what we wanted to do, what we wanted to accomplish. Um, But, like, at a certain point, we just sort of, like, had some weird Vulcan mind meld going on, and we just sort of knew what to write in the moment. I mean, it was a very organic process. There was almost no pre-planning for the scenes, the dialogue. So we just sort of went with it. I mean, he would literally write a sentence or a paragraph and then I just sort of intuitively knew when he was done and I would just start writing and that's how it worked it was sort of wild for like two hours a day every day until we finished wow that is really really weird I don't I don't know how you. it was an extremely weird process but it was also really fun and just working with him he's so dedicated um that it was sort of an inspiration and a, a creative boost to work with somebody like that. So I am also a very slow writer. So getting anything done in two hours, I'm like, oh, yeah, I have a page. But Greg's like, no, we'll have many pages. So I had to, like, <laughs> sort of keep up with him, which was a struggle at times because I'm, I'm so slow in the way that I just sort of internally think it all through before I write it down. But it was nice working with someone who has a different – mental speed than I do because it it helped me sort of jumpstart my own projects when I was sort of squandering off in the corner because the end of 19 and end of 2020 has not been kind to creative people. <laughs> uh, you talked about before having a, a mind meld with him, but mm-hmm. was there ever a moment you know, working together you may have different um, views on how maybe characters should go or, 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 you know, I guess dialogue between them. Uh, how did you, were there ever times where you guys were different on, on the way something should happen or, and how did you get through those type of issues? Mm, I'd say like if we had disagreements, they were pretty minor. And luckily in the Google doc on one side, you can have a chat going. So if we really weren't sure, it was just a quick back and forth. Hey, what do you think of, Rufus doing this or Sam doing that. No, I don't know, because what if we do this in the next scene? Oh, that works. I mean, it was really, like, nonchalant like that. There was never times where we were like, well, I hate you. We can't finish this because I just <laughs> disagree with you too much. So It wasn't, it wasn't the Beatles That was convenient. Up. <laughs> we just really sort of had the same ideas most of the time. Well, that's – so uh, – you see, I find this fascinating because you create these, – these are fiction – 
works of yes. arts. So you're creating everything in that in that uh, scene in that book. So mm-hmm. when you're doing that with someone else, how is it that like do you choose certain characters? Do, do, does he or like we, that's, we that's... each wrote one of the main characters. So he did one, I did the other, and that was basically, we were in charge of, I did all of my character's dialogue and action, he did all of his, and then we just shared all the supporting cast, to the point that I actually am not sure who wrote some of them, because we just mixed and matched halfway through. So one character, half of it he wrote, half of it I wrote, we're editing right now, and I'm like, who wrote this dialogue? (laughs) I don't know whether or not I can touch it, because I don't know who wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. So so now, how do you develop your character? So when you took a character to write in this book, mm-hmm. so did you put yourself in that character's place in it first firsthand in your mind so you become that character and then you interact with the one that he has developed? Is that kind of how you do it, or is it just... I, I really don't plan the characters that much. Like, I go in knowing, you know how they look, kind of how they sound, their name, maybe one major element of their backstory. But then everything else sort of grows pretty organically from that one initial concept. And I try not to to plan too much of it ahead of time, because then I I feel like I'll sometimes box myself in on an idea and I say, no, I can't change it because this was my original idea, when really that idea I had 70 pages in is much better so I just kind of go with the flow. I know Greg plans his a lot more, but he kind of gave up control a little bit and just sort of worked a little bit more how I did, which I thought was very cool because I would probably panic if I had to plan ahead of time. <laughs> so so he was the bottom. <laughs> he trusted me and dove into the deep end, and and I think he was – he, he was not necessarily willing, but he did it. Well, I, I mean, that's great. I, well, I think it's a learning experience oh, as yeah, you go definitely. through these for, for everybody. It doesn't matter how much you've written or what you, you know, it's oh, always a, yeah. you know, a new thing. So where, so where does it come from for you? Where did it start uh, for Carol? Like when did you start actually putting words on paper? Um, I started seriously writing in junior high, knowing full well that what I was writing at age 11 and 12 was garbage, (laughs) knowing that if I practiced every single day, it would one day be good enough once I figured out how to tell a story. Probably better Um, than what I can even write right now, but uh, (laughs) your your 11-year-old version. (laughs) Oh, man, I've seen some of those things. I was like, mother of God, (laughs) this needs to be burned. But um, no, I wrote every single day for years and all the way through college and out of college and then finally after I don't know like 15 years of of writing just for myself to practice I decided this was probably the moment that it was good enough that I could show it to somebody and I started getting published in 2015. Yeah but you know when did what is the turning point for a writer uh, in fiction for that confidence so you said all of a sudden there was um i felt good enough you know i still i vividly remember the moment that it happened but i'm not sure what it was that caused it it was just sort of suddenly almost it it was a moment that i figured out what my voice was in storytelling not just telling a story but where you pick it up and if you just read one sentence you're able to go oh this is a C.S. Poe book. This is a Gregory Ash book. This is a Josh Lanyon book. You can just tell, you know? Mm-hmm. And that was that moment where it clicked internally. And I said, oh, my gosh, like, this is the style, of this sort of short, simplistic sort of storytelling method that's very – I have a background in film, so I, I think that my writing is very short and simplistic in its sentence structure, but it's very visual. Um and there's a lot of uh, salt in, in the writing. <laughs> and that, I think that moment when I kind of embraced just my curmudgeonness and put that into words with all my characters, and I was like, oh, my God, this is me. This is unique. And I should just embrace it. 
But isn't that isn't that the confidence in itself? Maybe, like in the fact that where you're confident enough to be yourself in a book where it doesn't feel like what you're writing is 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 stupid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because that that was definitely the turning point. Everything else, you know, I felt you know, well, this is just a story, and they had that imposter syndrome almost. But right. When I figured out that this is this is my thing, it was a very different. You know, suddenly I'm very confident in my writing and I, I I take that with me and I try to put that into my writing that you always sense that the author is confident in the work that they're presenting because I feel like it makes a better reading experience too if you feel that you're in good hands for 200 pages yeah no it's true but you do you look back now do you go back um, to some of your first books and read them now and kind of go Oh my, I, I would change that. <laughs> well, um, it's funny that you say, because I actually did have to do that at the beginning of 2020. I um, had taken my backlist back and I republished everything. I, I self-published my, my backlist. So I had to reread like 14 or 15 books that I had written over the past few years and get them ready for new covers and formatting and just make sure that everything was okay as I was putting them back out there under my own name and my own publishing company. And some of them were like, oh, well, that was the decision that I made, <laughs> except that they're in audio, so I can't change the, the words because then it will <laughs> it will unsync itself from the audio and it's a whole thing. But, yeah, there were some instances where I was like, oh, huh, okay, well, Nothing I can do about that. Yeah. But do you think that's a, a normal process? But do you think even now what you're writing today in 20 years, you could look back and kind of go, well, I don't know if yes. I would do it that way. Do you think that's yes. normal? Yeah. I think every book should be like that. Every book should always be better than the one I just put out. Even well, if it's just a little bit, even if it's just one thing that I figured out how to tell better or explain better or visualize in a reader's mind better as long as that book was better <laughs> right and so what what's the most important thing to you in the writing is it the character is it the story or is it the actual um prose or grammar or the, the wording i don't think there is any just one most important thing because i could say yeah the definitely the grammar and then i'm like no the structure no the characters, no, don't forget the setting, too, because that's also a character. So it's really, it's, it's everything. I feel like to even let one of those aspects suffer, the whole book suffers. But I feel like especially is setting. I see so many people in so many books overlook the setting, and setting is a character. You know, it, the, A Friend in the Dark was about Sam and Rufus, but it was also about New York City. And if we hadn't written New York City as a character, that would be a very different book because your whole, um, your emotions and your your visual cues and the the gravity and and depth are hidden in the setting. And to just not expand on that and make it a character, you lose so much because it, it's a character that doesn't speak but it sets the mood for everything. Now, that's important. When you say um, a character that doesn't speak, so when you talk about the setting, now I write true crime, so mm -hmm. I don't get to choose the setting. It is, it is right. what it is. Right. But I find this a really difficult process, is how can I have that setting speak to the, li to the readers? Because without it sounding stupid. Do you know what I mean? Like there's Right. Oh, it's so important even with nonfiction. So so how do you so what what's the key elements? Can you narrow that down? Um, what would you say to someone uh, if they're missing I mean, that? My a a piece of advice is at least the advice that I follow for myself. I never like to say there's a hard and fast rule to do things because it's, if someone's telling you the right the correct way to write then they're wrong in my opinion. <laughs> um, yeah. But the rule that I follow for myself is I never write about a location I haven't been to because how do I actually know what it's like? How do I know what it sounds like and what the wind feels like when you're walking down the street? And 
how do I know what it smells like on trash day? All these, these little tiny characteristics that when you build it up, it creates this place that is wholly unique in a state or a country. Like yeah. New York, you can't just walk, you walk down the street of New York and, and there's so many little elements that make it what it is. Yeah, and I think that's important. But so when you're, when you're walking down the street, when you're describing that, um, how do you choose your elements to display to the reader? What, what do you find? It, it depends on the book. You know, if I'm, if I'm writing a, a sort of gritty mystery, like A Friend in the Dark was a fairly bleak story at times, um, pretty rough story. So we went for descriptions that were, I guess, grosser, like... <laughs> describing that dog poop caking on the on the cement in in the August heat, which I wouldn't have used that description in like um, the steampunk series I'm writing right now that also takes place in New York City because it's the wrong flavor. You know, it's it's too bleak and gross and dirty for what the atmosphere of the New York character is in a very different piece. It's funny you use the word flavor with dog poop. <laughs> well, you know, it's got a very distinct one. <laughs> yeah, well, there. Now, I, I, we were just, I just talking to Austin Thomas Burton, and he said to say Oh, hi. yeah. He said yeah. say hi. Um, we were talking a lot about characters and how he, he – um, and for him, there's a lot of characters that when he's reading people's books at times, they just don't seem believable. They don't seem real. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and 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 I think a lot of the conversation we had was talking about how there's a there's a kind of a generic element that people create characters from a yeah know. character X has Y job rinse and repeat yeah so how do you keep from doing that like when you're writing yours um, how do you know it's kind of you're not falling into that um, that that sort of trap um. Well, a lot of my characters, there's something about them that tends to be a more unique element. Um, I have a, an amateur sleuth character who has a, a, a vision condition. He, he can only see in black and white, which is a, a real condition um, that also hinders how he can see in like normal daylight. He has trouble reading fine print. You know, this is not a condition I have, although it's something that I thoroughly researched for his character. And I feel that you don't need to have that condition in order to relate to his very real human insecurities or growths. And that's sort of something that I, I pull out for characters now and then, a character with narcolepsy, um, a character, you know, in A Friend in the Dark with Greg, um, one of the characters has anxiety from his upbringing and how he's carried that into his adult life and what he does for a living. And I feel like that's just one thing that you can consider when you build a character is no human is born out of the womb perfect. No one is. And we all have something that makes us unique, whether it's, you know, something that we struggle with or something that is something that makes us great in a way, you know, we're all different, and I feel that that's something you need to keep in mind, because if you're trying to build a three-dimensional character, what makes him like everyone else on the street, but different at the same time, you know? So that's part of the research you do then? Yeah, that's part of I a mean, lot of the research I do. I do way too much research. Well, no, but I think that's important, because I think that makes it, it, makes it the most believable in a book, right? Mm. Right? Mm. Because uh, the worst thing in the world is going through a story and it's something that's really off, you know, something that doesn't oh, make yeah. sense yeah. Or, or some wording or, you know, one of the things that bugs me the most, you know, um, I was watching a series on um, Prime and it was about the, uh, the Jewish hunting uh, old Nazis and... Um, you know, they would say things like, oh, thank you for your service and all this stuff. And this is supposed to be happening back in the 60s. Right. You know, they used phrases that are used today that were not used back then. And so it kind of, it was, it yeah, kind of, it kind of wrecked. I, I just got done writing a book that takes place in the 1880s. So I had to double check so many words. 
Well, yeah, because, they, you know, if, if you're unaware, it doesn't matter. But then if someone is kind of aware of an area, like it, a city. It pulls you out. Yeah. yeah you it just kinda, realize it's just one place. Well, you know, I can let a mistake or two go by. But if it's a plethora of, you know, modern slang and colloquialisms, did the author care? <laughs> yeah. You know, I could take a Starbucks cup in a... <laughs> <laughs> in in in, a, in in the back of uh, you know Game of Thrones, but I can't think if, you know if if they're talking. That poor PA never got a call back for the next day. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what I mean. You can only you know, yeah. So, um, so I find that interesting. So now you're you're starting this series. This I, I see it's coming out next month if all things are good. Called the Gangster. Now, yeah, it's the second book. Okay, so what what is mm-hmm. this? Um, Explain steampunk, that whole term, that whole idea, and especially in writing a book. So steampunk is a, it's a branch of sci-fi, but I like to describe it as sci-fi, but in the past. So um, it typically takes place during what would be the Victorian era um, or a little into what would be considered the American Gilded Era. So in this case, I chose 1880 as a good sweet spot. I just like that decade a lot. Um, And it's basically, it's historically accurate to a point. And then you really screw it up by adding wild technology that doesn't exist in the time period. Think like Wild Wild West. Okay, yeah. It's like that, where there's normal, normal, technology of the time and then suddenly you totally throw a wrench into the works by having a giant spider with a gatling gun on its back chasing you down a street like (laughs) or giant (laughs) steam zeppelins that shouldn't exist at the time um like that alien and the cowboys it's it's sort it's it's really in the best thing about steampunk is that it can sort of be as long as you kind of follow like is it take place in the right time period? And does it have steam powered technology, specifically steam? As long as you follow like those two rules, it's sort of the world is your oyster. You can do whatever you want. And that's what I think is so cool about that genre. And um, so in this case, it take, my series takes place in New York City in the 1880s. And it follows a, uh, a federal agent who In this world, there's also magic involved, which some steampunk authors do, some don't. And he's a magic-wielding federal agent who is uh, chasing down bad guys with the help of a vigilante. Magic. So you got, so it's uh, uh, like witchcraft magic or? It's like elemental magic. It's like, uh, you know, he can cast lightning spells and fire spells. And he's chasing down bad guys who are, building these, this like grandiose illegal magic that they don't know how to control and that it's going to do terrible things to the world. And he has to stop them. And before you were talking about how, um, you know, you only write about places that you've, you've been to. Um, mm-hmm. and, and now, so this book is about magic. Are you, and obviously that's not going to apply to every facet of, of writing, uh, what you do, but what about magic? Are you a practitioner or, or have you heard from them and, um, kind of get what their opinion on so you can make it as real as possible. Oh, no, this this magic, I, I sort of just invented the system myself, but I <laughs> applied a lot of science to it because I guess I just couldn't do enough research for this series as if writing something in the 1880s wasn't research heavy enough. I decided that I would also have the magic follow real rules of science. So I had to half the time I was constantly looking up, all right, what's the melting point of silver and what will react to electricity, but not fire. And like, I don't know why I did this to myself, but I I did. Well, well, magic uh, precedes science, right? So magic is the idea that, uh, you know, it's science that we just don't really have a good grasp of. Right. Yeah. And steampunk was sort of like the best genre to sort of combine the two, because that's sort of what steampunk is, where it it combines history and then these fantastical elements. So I was like, you know what? Why not throw magic in there, too, and really mess with people? Do you uh, do you ever go to any of the uh, you know, I have a couple of steampunk friends who who do the whole, you know, conference uh, circuit as well. Do you you get dressed up and, and do the whole thing? I have never gotten to go to one. I've always wanted to just I love 
the costumes and the attires and just how creative people are. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to have gone if uh, my lady, Miss COVID, had not graced us <laughs> with her presence. Ah, oh, she's your mistress, too. Oh, boy. She's a whore. She, she gets around. <laughs> my God. <laughs> she's a whore. <laughs> Especially in the United States here. I know uh, Alan's oh. in Canada, so they are doing okay. But, yeah, over here. Uh, so especially in New York, right, where you are. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in Manhattan, so. Mm -hmm. Epicenter. Yeah. yeah, they're talking about shutting things down again. Yeah, you know, it's strange because uh, I'm, out, uh, I'm in the west so um, of Canada right now, and uh, we had 45 uh, new cases yesterday. So uh, That's nothing compared to here. But they, in in well, all of Canada? No, just in the West, but that's like, you know, Vancouver's got a couple million and all the West. But you know wow. what? So they put us on lockdown on that. Wow. It's mandatory, wow. It's, it's mandatory mask. We're level three, so stores are open, but most of the restaurants and bars and Mandatory mask. Can we borrow your prime minister? <laughs> well, that was, it was real Like, simple. that would even work here, even if they said you have to wear, you have to. Like, they'd be like, oh. yeah. But what? I, Let me I, dream. Let me dream. I don't <laughs> okay, understand. Sorry, so didn't mean to mean crap on you. <laughs> I just don't understand what the issue is. Like when you, you know, uh, you know, it's pretty. It's a lung infection. You, you can give it to someone. So put a mask on, and it cuts it down. So how hard can that? I don't. What's the problem? You know, all I can think is I am very sorry that the public school system failed so many people on basic science and health. Yeah. That's all I can really think. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if I bet it on the, the school system. People just don't listen. I, I did some that of my that too. Well, this is the damn word that. anyone said in school. So I, you know. I yeah, but you <laughs> no, no, but I get you. I get what you're saying. But I'm sure you know everybody's. <laughs> we had we had an an, an anti mask rally in the city of Vancouver, and it's like uh, three million people, and twenty. Then people. just like a a few dozen show up. Yeah, that. twenty people <laughs> showed up. <laughs> Wow. And it's like if people were walking by and going, oh, okay. Oh, you wow. know, it, you spit just, on them? <laughs> no, well, no, you just kind of go, what are these people doing, you know? And it's just like, are you okay? You know, oh. that's kind of very Canadian. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd give I'm you so a hug if it wasn't COVID. You. Yeah, it's just, but it's strange because I don't understand the aggression ag held up against it where you'd actually dress up, go downtown and start and wear a sign, you know. And I don't pick. think most People do understand that. <laughs> I don't ever want to understand it. Put it that way. I'm happy to wear a mask. Yeah, yes, it's not that big a deal. Uh, you get no. used to it, and it's kind of now I don't even think about I it. Accessorized. You know? I accessorized. I got masks with sparkles on them. I'm ready. Mine's got a dinosaur. See, there you go. You just add a little touch <laughs> personality to it. You're ready. That is very surprising, Alan. I would have assumed it would have been something a little more uh, sexual. If you haven't noticed... Uh, Poe, no. um, that he can turn anything sexual, in, you know, anything regular into sexual in nature. So, Well, I grew up with Howard Stern. I'm the gay Howard Stern. <laughs> what can I say? You know, it just comes natural. It's okay. But... Oh, it's a gift. Yeah, I just don't see the big deal. I don't Am know. I your Robin? <laughs> yeah, you are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except for the hair, but we, we can work on that. Yeah, one day it'll come in. Yeah. <laughs> so now, Steve Punk, all this, sir, it, it, so you've got this book coming out. Now, your characters, let's talk about these characters. Um, again, do you draw from people you know, people you've seen no. on the street? Maybe oh, not even somebody who gets murdered? You're like, I hate this guy, so I'm going to get them murdered in my book right now. Like, yeah, ah, I think that, that's a missing opportunity right there. Maybe, but I without... <laughs> Without sounding egotistical, I think my own creativity is more interesting than the, the people I pass on the street. <laughs> so I don't oh. tend to make characters based off of people I see. Yeah, but you know, okay, but wow. So how do you develop them? Like, how do you how do you get them to be a real person? Oh man, when I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> part I, of the magic. That's part of I you know I just finished the second book it's it's in edits right now and I was Greg can attest cuz he's heard all about the struggle of me finishing this book but I was like 40 pages from the end before I actually figured out the big issue with the main character like this this emotional baggage that he had been carrying through the book 40 pages from the end and I'm like 
<laughs> mother of God, that's what it is. <laughs> I had to go back and fix so many things. He's like, oh, that's great. I'm like, it's not great. I have to go back and fix 150 pages now. Yeah, yeah, that's stressful. Edit's so, always hard. I just sort of roll with it, and usually it comes from uh, – I, I really like writing dialogue, and I think it might come from my background in film where I, I worked on a lot of scripts, and film is very visual, and you carry a lot of the story through dialogue if you understand how to do it correctly and not info dump. Um, but dialogue, even just like a passing comment between characters is usually where I'll find that aha moment. So sometimes I just, I just write and I'll find it between pages five and 200. And it's usually through dialogue. Wow. That's interesting. I, 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 I find that fascinating. I, I couldn't imagine, um, that's, that's a pretty special gift in a way, uh, to be able to write like that i think uh because i i i don't know that i could it's I, it's an interesting process it's a slow process <laughs> wow so now where where do you see this going like so you this is the second book in this series do, mm-hmm. do you find that you like writing series um oh yeah i love series this one is four seems to be my my number of choice so it's four books now, you know, with the same character, you've got Special Agent uh, uh, Gillian ha- Hamilton. Yeah, uh, Gillian uh, Hamilton. Gillian. Yeah. <laughs> you say Gillian, I say Gillian. <laughs> oh, I know. It's been, a, it's been a whole thing. I've had readers emailing me, is it Gillian or Gillian? <laughs> Alan, I'm going to say go with what the writer says. I'm, I'm just on this one. Just, just no, I'm taking my mask <laughs> off now. <laughs> But but what, what well I mean that's that's a whole other story right when you when you get the uh, people writing into you but oh, yeah. uh, but how do you, so again so you have to take this character uh, uh, and and develop them book to book to book to book yeah and you still have to hold on to what they've done in the previous books yeah and I have a terrible memory so oh <laughs> <laughs> Luck, luckily you write it down so <laughs> oh God. But it's so boring to go back and read it for, like, the umpteen time because you're not really sure what you're looking for, but you know you wrote it. You should probably revisit it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think that would be important. I would think that you'd want to – because there's nuance. There's little things that yeah. you've done with a character in a book and then a the next book and then wait till you get to the next, third book. And Oh, my gosh, I know. <laughs> and certain things, certain likes or dislikes or things they've said because you're doing dialogue – yeah, you have to make sure that it's consistent. I would think that would be uh, the challenge. Yeah, sometimes um, what I actually did this time is luckily a lot of my books are in audio now. So when I was taking breaks, like when I stopped to to make lunch or something, and I knew that something I needed to know was in the first book, I was playing the audio of the first book and just listening to it while I was making lunch, and I was like, "Oh, that was what he said." Okay, now I know. <laughs> so I didn't have to like page through it trying to figure out what I was looking for. Yeah. So that's a plus for audio. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, actually, I love audio, Audible. They they know that I've got hundreds of books because my I had cataract <laughs> surgery and all I do is listen now. Oh, it's I cra- love audio too. Yeah, it's just it's just crazy, but and they've gotten so good. So. Yes. Oh my God! Some of these narrators are so talented. Yeah, there's some real good ones out there. I'm I'm pretty impressed. Some of the early ones were it was kind of hit and miss. But. It, it was yeah, I, I have one of those right it. now. I have one of those right now, and they're just making this great book just absolutely awful, and it's just oh. a real trudge. But uh, yeah, <laughs> what's that? What is that one of my books? <laughs> uh, I didn't want to say it, but and and he Alan does actually narrate his own books too. Yeah. I don't know if you know. <laughs> I know that'd be the day. No, 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 past that, no. Wow. So this is great. Um, so what, what, what would your advice be to someone that's just starting to write? You've got so many books out now. What would you say to someone that's never been published, but, but they're interested in, in following this up? What, what's, what's your biggest piece of advice? Practice. Do not write one book and think that you are ready to smack a price tag on it. <laughs> you should most likely want to throw that one away and hide it from anyone ever seeing it. And that's, that's sort of the whole point. You want to be better than that first one. You don't want to write a book, 
self edit it and put it up for 99 cents in Kindle Unlimited because it's not fair to you. It's not fair to readers. It's not fair to your creative growth. You need to keep writing, keep practicing and trust your gut when you think, okay, this is the moment that I should take that step. So an editor is very important, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Please don't cut corners on editors. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a huge, huge position. If someone asks me, I always say, yeah, get an editor. Make sure you got Absolutely. An, an editor that challenges you as well. Yes. That has no problem telling you, yeah. oh, this and that, or I like this, or this doesn't and work. Yeah, and it's okay to not, you know, to trial and error, like, yeah, maybe that editor just didn't work for you. Maybe they just didn't get your voice or your style, and that's totally fine. But when you do find that right editor, they are only trying to make you better. Don't take it personally. Yeah, they're, they're, just, want, uh, they're just trying to make a better book. In a way, you yeah. write the story, and they write the book in that part, right? That's so exactly. important. So important. How do you find this? Um, so you, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but I, I find this interesting um, with um, COVID and with 2020 <laughs> and all the stress. You know, you got the president that's a dingbat. You've got, um, oh. you know, you've got all this stuff going on. You got, you had protests. You had, it's been a year. I think but, I aged about 20 years. Oh yeah. Easy. And, um, but I was going to say, so when you're writing, uh, does it get into your writing? Like, I know you're not going to write about COVID in the 1800s, you know, it's not, but does the stress of what's around you, um, seep in somehow does it become more dark or negative in your yeah. writing? i don't know i was thinking about that earlier actually i think um the stress and sort of just the general doom and gloom of the past year it slowed me down creatively but i think it probably <laughs> i'm trying to think back on things i've written this year and and I, I think that might have darkened a little bit of what I wrote, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not, even my contemporary stuff, I have no interest in including COVID in any of my writing. Um, but I think just the, the atmosphere definitely seeped into some of the word choices. Well, I would think it would have to, uh, because even in your day-to-day -day life, like when stress is going on around you with, with other things, even in a year that 2019 when there wasn't COVID, um, that ups and downs are going to affect your feelings and that affects mm -hmm. your, your dialogue and writing, I would think. Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially anything prolonged is, is really going to start seeping in. You know, and I've got... COVID I've, has been prolonged. <laughs> hey, this is a really good idea. So on book three in 1881... Uh, Gillian discovers that there's uh, they're creating a, a virus called COVID. <laughs> Genius. Oh, my God. Genius. <laughs> oh, man. And they're going to, and they hide it away for, for the year 2020. <laughs> yeah. You see, you see, this is why the I origin. don't write. Yeah, this is why I don't write fiction, you know. Yeah, yeah, stick it to a crime, <laughs> respectfully. Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of that, have, I mean... Crime is stranger than fiction. <laughs> the truth definitely is. Well, have you ever thought about that? Uh, you talk about crime a lot in, in your books. Have you ever thought about kind of going over to the true crime area, genre? I, I haven't... I don't have the interest in writing it, but I definitely love reading and watching and learning about it. Um because, man, there's some wild stuff going on out there where I'm like, honestly, if I put this in a fiction book, someone would call me out and say it wasn't believable. And it <laughs> actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Which I'm I... sure you probably, Alan, yeah. would feel where you're reading something or researching something and you're like, really? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Well, not so much now. Uh, years ago, yeah, but now it's sort of... Um... You've hardened... <laughs> I, I sort of have, I, I don't know if I've hardened, but I sort of, I'm not surprised anymore. I've seen too many nut jobs talk mm. to them in person. I've seen too many, I, it's just things that you just, you would go, yeah, that's ridiculous. And then. Yeah, you're like, I'm not surprised that I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. You know, almost like 
it's it's just crazy stuff that you you think, oh, that's really you know it's far fetched, it's stupid, mm. right? And, well, and, you have um you have a book about. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm totally blanking on his name. Colonel Russell? Is oh, that yeah. his name? Yeah. I, getting... I watched a show about him. So when I saw your book, I was like, oh, my God, I know this guy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like, know. This, that was one of the crazier ones I had watched, too. I was like, wow, this guy made a lot of choices in his life. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, actually, and that's, that's probably my best-selling book ever because, yeah, I've done shows on it. And it I've was done... fascinating. Well, the thing is, too, and then it's in the third printing, and this is the, oh wow, yeah, and this is the, uh, uh, we we went with a new cover for this version. I have never, I've caught so much flack for this cover. Really? Yeah. But they're, they're well, real photos. Like yeah, yeah, you should you should have put yourself on the cover. So <laughs> well, no, I no. You see, because when I was with the the original publisher that did it, did it a small little. It was part of a series, and it did so well that they got into second print, and then they did a a really nice cover, and it went on its own. But with the third cover, um, I I said to them, "Listen, you know, it's the the cover you do is boring." Um, there's just nothing to it. And they, and they said, yeah, but, you know, what do you want? And I said, well, I want to show both sides of this guy. Yeah, he definitely was a, a dichotomy. Yeah. He and took I the think, pictures himself, you know? Yeah, so. and, and I think that's important. So, yeah. so, they, so it happened and it came out. Now I get 20 to 200 uh, messages a day now what? in the last week. And oh, my God. Gosh. Really, really abusive. Wow. Negative. Um, just crazy. I, I, you know, I had someone even in the gay groups. I had to take it out of uh, a lot of the gay groups that I'm in because, huh. as as a writer, and I even talked to a couple of the administrators and saying, I cannot believe this. You know, there's there's a, that this book cover. They said makes transsexuals look like it's a disease and there it's a sickness and. And I'm getting all that sort of stuff, and I'm thinking, well, the book cover shows two sides of a guy, a person, and what right. he did. He was not transsexual. He was not a no, transvestite. He, he, yeah, he wasn't transgender at all. It was, no, he was. He wanted to masturbate in the female's clothes, and yeah, and then it, he filmed it, and you know, whatever the case. I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but this is what he did. I can't. Right. The fact that. was is that they were his own photos, and it wasn't a, a statement on anything. It was just, just that was the thing that he had done. <laughs> yeah, he makes he makes bathing suits look good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting reaction. I wouldn't have expected that. Neither did I. Neither did I. Uh, you would not believe how many bad. Uh, comments on the cover, uh, you know, and I'm taking it. Maybe like, they should read the content and well, find that's out sort of, that's my why opinion. the cover is the way it is. Yeah, and that's my opinion, and I think that's what they should. But at the same time, I don't want to get into this this argument with people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sort yeah, of no, sitting back. Exhausted. Yeah, sitting back, let it let it kind of go. And I guess in a way, of course, you know, the the publishing agency says, well, this is great. You know, it's back in the top ten, and and you know. <laughs> Like, yeah, that, one of those uh, yeah. no marketing's bad marketing kind of situation. Uh, yeah, you know, and and I sort of I was happy with this. I was really happy with the cover, but so people, you know, so how does that make you feel? Like when you're getting um, feedback that you didn't expect necessarily. Um, you know, most of the time, the the I mean, for fiction, it's definitely different. Right. Um, yeah. In most people who go out of their way to message me usually only have something nice to say, which I really appreciate because, you know, at a certain point, who wants to have the mental headspace for people attacking you? Um, I really only recently had, had one very negative comment, but it was somebody who told me that because uh, the steampunk books, Gillian and Gunner, are to gay men in the 1880s, and that's something that I explore as a sub, sort of a subgenre is their relationship on top of action and adventure and explosions and also what these two have to go through to be together. And um, this gentleman went out of his way to email me to let me know that uh, he was very disappointed that I was pushing an agenda. So I responded by making the second book even more gay than I had initially <laughs> planned. 
And it Which didn't. no one thought was possible, but somehow Which no one thought you was did possible, it. but I did it. And I was very <laughs> proud of myself. Well, um, and that's uh, really it. You know, the, the only times that I really hear something negative, someone has their own agenda to push, whether it's, mm-hmm. oh, the cover model wasn't hot. All right, that's fine. But I didn't ask your opinion. <laughs> and well, you're pushing an agenda with the content. Sure. I'm pushing a positive relationship between two human beings. I will now make it more gay. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't really understand that because uh, there, there's a uh, um, yeah, there's a underlying current that everything has to have an agenda. Well, right. She's obviously a socialist. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I thought I was just trying to write a good book, but man, this guy, he reminded me more gay. <laughs> yeah, where's the cock? <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Let me put that right in there. I got to find a different word, something more socially acceptable to the 1880s. But no. Well, you, with, you know, I, I would think that would be interesting uh, in the sense that. Um, how that was an illegal relationship back then, right? Yeah, there's, I'm, you know, <laughs> there's so much history at that time period where it wasn't entirely illegal in certain places that you were. And in New York City, you had the Bowery, the street where there were these nightclubs and these places that you could go if you were LGBT and it was a safe place to be. And that was also the time that um, apartment buildings were starting to become a thing. They were called hotel apartments and they were for single men because there was an influx of single men in society and they didn't have wives, they didn't have families and they didn't really have anywhere to live. So these hotel apartments started to come about and they were these private dwellings and there's the suggestion that they became something more because they were private homes for men. And it was almost like, it's okay if you just don't talk about it. But then once, you know, police started raiding all the clubs on the Bowery, it became more talked about and shunned about. And then by the turn of the century, that's when you had, you know, a lot of negative slang coming out. And then by 1900s and then into the 1920s, that's when everything just went really downhill. And then, you know, the 1950s with the all-American family and (laughs) 2.5 children and then having to recover from that. But in the 1880s, it was almost okay in this weird sort of gray zone. You just couldn't really talk about it, but it was almost okay in a big urban environment. They were just bachelors. Exactly. They were just, you know, confirmed bachelors living in their own little hotel apartment, quite discreet and quiet. But you see, that, I think that's what makes the story interesting is when you mm-hmm. you learn something as well. There's something about the history. There's something about the, the, the place they oh, were yeah. at. I, I actually the, was reading a book for some of the research. It's called um, Gay New York, I think. And it's literally about gay New York from like the 1890s until like the 1920s. Fascinating. Highly recommend it. I do believe it won a Lambda award. Yeah, I think I, I, I I was probably in it back in 1910. (laughs) (laughs) I'm that old. So when someone reads your book, they Mm -hmm. take, they take, they pick up one of your books, they read it. And um, is there something you want them to get out of the book? other than the story or the characters and that sort of part of it, is there an underlying theme in there? Um, you know, it's, it's something on one hand, because, again, I, I mentioned film. Back in, in film school, there was two types of students. There was the artiste and there was the Hollywood kid. The Hollywood kid just wanted to tell a fun story, make a good movie. And the artiste, did not like the Hollywood kid because they were quote unquote sellouts and only the artists could tell a good story and make it believable because I don't know what their thought process was behind that. But I was one of the Hollywood kids and they always, even my own teacher told me I would never make a good story, never make a good movie because I was selling out making just a Hollywood film. And I realized there's nothing wrong with telling a fun, exciting story, whether it's my amateur sleuth, literally falling into a dead body or this, you know, steampunk action adventure in the 1800s. It really doesn't matter what it is, as long as I commit to making it fun and try in even the smallest way to make sure that a reader 
saw themselves in a character and it, they don't have to have, you know, that exact thing that the character has that they relate to, but just that those emotions, the character felt through the books were real enough that someone else would felt, I felt that way in my life, whether it was because they were gay or because maybe they had anxiety or just by being alive, as long as they had fun reading it and felt seen in that character to me that's a good book and that's all i want to do wow now do you have a website or a place that you want people to come stalk you well i do have a website it's really easy cspo.com and i'm on a lot of face i'm on a, a lot of social media like facebook twitter yeah, I did notice that you were uh, you were on Twitter, and I also couldn't help notice that you retweeted uh, Moon Pies. Uh, oh man, times. Moon Pie, Moon Pie saved yeah, me. Yeah, I, I like you. I'm a Moon Moon Pie lover, and Alan Warren, stop your jokes there. But uh, uh, but yes, yeah, so I I appreciate your Moon Pie uh, tweeting. So you could be found on uh, on Twitter, by the way. Oh, under, yes, under yeah. Moon Pie. Or I'll be retweeting Moon Pie, screaming into his pillow. Do they pay you in free moon pies? Because uh, that would I be would. a hell of a deal. I would be retweeting them a lot more if they would send me a box. <laughs> I've never had a moon pie. Oh, shame. Or or you, you really got to do it. I, I'm going to send you one. That's it. I'm writing it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, old moon pie. <laughs> wow. Well, what we'll do is we'll put your website up as well as your oh, books. Thank you. And people can do one click if they're listening. And, again, it's been great. Um, we've been talking to author... Carol Poe, otherwise known as C.S. Poe. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.